All right, today is going to be some of the more abstract stuff, but it's foundationally probably the most important section in chapter four. And there's two main concepts that we want to get across. And again, it's very abstract, but the algebra is actually very, very simple. So the first concept, and this is a hugely important concept, is linear independence. <clears throat> okay. I would like to talk about what it takes for a set to be linearly independent or not. And yes, not independent, it is correct to say dependent. More often than not, people will just say it's either linearly independent or it is not. But saying linearly dependent is the same thing as not independent. There, right, there's only two possibilities, there's not a, a third. So linear independence is kind of the notion that, first of all, things aren't multiples. And they're definitely not linear combinations of other things. So consider the following. <clears throat> consider set as, and to make it simple right now, let's say we're working with pure vectors. Th this will change. But just for the notation standpoint, suppose we're working with pure vectors. And set S is V1, <clears throat> V2, through Vk. And this set is contained in Rn. Okay, we will talk about this when it comes to matrices, when it comes to polynomials, when it comes to functions. You're here. Andre, no. email me, you weren't going to be here. Yes, my doctor actually said that I could come in early. Oh, so cool. now I'm here. Excellent, excellent. So I hate that we canceled the party, we or postponed the party, but it's too late now because they sent the cake back and you know all the ice cream was going to melt. We, anyway, so I have a set of things, a set of vectors in this case. <clears throat> C1V1 plus C2V2 plus plus CKVK equals the zero vector for R what? For Rn. <clears throat> we know this has a solution. The C's, <clears throat> the C's are just real numbers. We know this has a solution. <clears throat> okay? There's two possibilities, though. Either it has exactly one solution where all the C's are zero, or it has a parameterized solution, in which case there would be how many solutions? Infinity. Yeah, so my choices are one or infinity. <laughs> a unique solution or it's a dependent system, but it's definitely consistent. We know that, okay? So I want to solve this system. If the CIs are zero is the only solution, and by the way, the term you'll, you'll hear all the time is we say the trivial solution. That's what that term means. And some of you have run across that in your reading, you know, what exactly is that? The trivial solution is when all the coefficients are zero. The trivial solution is always a solution to the homogeneous equation. Our question is, is it the only solution? Now go back to matrix algebra. <clears throat> if AX equals B, has a unique solution, then the trivial solution is the only solution. Or excuse me, AX equals zero, sorry. Is the, we know the trivial solution is A solution. If it's the only solution, then it means that A is not singular, the determinant is not zero, it's row equivalent to the identity. All of the list of, of conditions applies. This is going in that direction, although we're not talking about a matrix. If this is the only solution, then set S is linearly independent. <clears throat> now, you actually have to do the algebra to make the conclusion, but it's often the case that it's really, really easy. If I gave you two vectors in R2, you can tell me if they're linearly independent or not without doing any work whatsoever. I'm going to give you two vectors in R2. Let's suppose I gave you vector x is 3 comma 6 and vector y is 2 comma 4. Are these vectors linearly independent or not, do you think? <coughs> well, if I said c1 of these plus c2 of these equals 0, 0,
does this have a unique solution? Zero, zero, obviously, is a solution. Yeah. But what if C1 equal two and C2 equal negative three? Would that also be a solution? Huh. I just found a non-trivial solution. Are there any others? I think there's at least two more. Or or maybe how many more? Infinitely, Infinitely many more. Yeah. Take any scalar multiple of that, right? Yeah. You know, 20 and negative 30 would also work. The fact is, how could you have identified these were not independent without doing any work? Because they are I heard somebody mumble it over here. Multiples of each other? They're multiples of each other. Oh, if I have two vectors that are multiples of each other, they can't be linearly independent because it's really easy for me to now take a linear combination and get the zero vector. So if two vectors were multiples of each other, that's the easiest way to fail independence. Now, if I change any one number. <clears throat> All right, let's make this two negative four. Now I want to do the same problem. Because they were multiples, it was very easy for me to simply identify. Now I'm going to need to solve this. And let's use a matrix, because that's going to be our standard way of doing this kind of problem. So when I make my matrix, remember, C1 of these plus C2 of these gives me 0, 0. That's how I know they go in these columns. I, I could expand this. It would be absolutely correct for me to expand this, in which case it'd say 3C1 plus 2C2 equals 0 and 6C1 minus 4C2 equals 0. That would be my system of equations if I expand it. And you see I have the same things. Now, I want to solve this using a matrix. So how about negative row 1 plus row 2? So 0. I'm sorry, negative two row ones plus row two. Negative eight, zero, well I can stop now. Negative eight, C2 is zero, so C2 is zero. Three, C1 plus zero is zero, so C1 is zero. Okay, great. I gave you two vectors in R2 and they were not multiples. They are linearly independent. But the proof of independence is always you set up this and you solve this. Sometimes though, that's easy. What if I gave you three vectors in R3 and they were not multiples? Is it trivial to determine if it's independent or dependent, or would you have to do a little bit of work? What do you think? I need three vectors in R3. I want this part to be real simple. I want, I want this to be easy. So I'm going to give you three vectors in R3. Let's say my set is um, negative 2, 1, 4, 3, negative 5, 2, 2, negative 8, 12. I'd like to determine if these three vectors are linearly independent. Well, they're obviously not multiples of each other. So I start the problem, and I'm lazy. This is the way I like to do it. I'm going to call this one V1. V2, V3. So now I'm going to set up the following equation. Why did I do it that way? Because I'm too lazy to write out those vectors. But I actually have to set up the equation that I'm about to solve. If I don't state this, then what am I solving? Any conclusion I get, what is it representing? Here's my system that I'm solving. Now, can I go directly to a matrix? We've been working on this the last few days. Again, going back to here. That's the column that represents C1. That's the column that represents C2. That's the column that represents the solution on the other side. So these vectors are going to go in as columns. I don't need to physically to expand it and write out the system of equations. In this case, I can go directly to this. I know this is consistent. All right, those vectors go in as columns. I know it's consistent. The question is, is it dependent? Or is the trivial solution the only solution? 
I'm not that good that I can tell you that without doing any work. I gotta do something here. So I'm gonna do a row switch to start with. So now let's do two row ones plus row two. Oops, sorry. Two row ones plus row two in the right place. And negative seven. Two of these negative 16 plus that would be negative 14. And negative four row ones plus row three. Negative four, so that would be 22. Negative four, so 32, so 44. How about if I do negative one seventh row two? So zero one two zero. Hmm. Hmm. Negative twenty two row twos plus row three. I can work up, yes. I'm not trying to solve this. If I was trying to solve this, then I would actually try to figure out what the C1, C2, and C3 are. That's correct. We're not trying to solve this. We're just trying to determine if the set is linearly independent or not. I have two non-zero rows. I have three unknowns. Therefore, I would have to parameterize. This is a dependent system. Or another way of saying it, how about There's no unique solution. This is, the, this is a good time to use that term. We know it's consistent. That's not the question. The question was, is the trivial solution the only solution, or are there non-trivial solutions? That's actually a term. There are infinitely many non-trivial solutions. We can use that language. We can say there is no unique solution, which automatically means there's infinitely many. Any way that I'm saying this, and it's clear. So what is your conclusion? So you can say linearly dependent, or you could say what? It's not, linear. not linearly independent. You're saying exactly the same thing. And I want you to get used to saying it both ways because you're going to read it both ways. So could you find the determinant of that, like the coefficient? Could I say this? Yes, absolutely. Instead of doing all the row switching? Yes. And if yeah, let's, let's, let's back up a step. The question was, this system of equations right here, we know it's consistent. Does it have only the trivial solution or are there non-trivial solutions? So in the form ax equals the zero vector, that has a unique solution if and only if the determinant of the coefficient matrix is not zero. So could I have used determinant to get this conclusion? In this case, yes. How do you know which one to do? The answer is yes. Doesn't matter. It's like, which one do you feel faster at? Which one are you more, more comfortable with? So if you had done the determinant of the coefficient matrix, tell me about that determinant. You know what the value is. B zero. It is zero, because there was no unique solution. So let's suppose instead, instead you decided to do Because you decided to rewrite this as AX equals the zero vector. Right, you wrote that matrix times the C1, C2, C3 equals zero, 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 and you attacked this and you got zero. So you would now say AX equals zero does not have a unique solution. Same conclusion, isn't it? Different means, same conclusion. What if someone, uh, they want to find the inverse of A? Yeah, I could do that. It's a lot of extra work. And tell me about the inverse of A. It does not exist. It does not exist, so I'd be <laughs> really running around in circles. But if you could prove that A inverse does not exist, same conclusion. I think the determinant or the row operations are probably the only way you're going to go. Hey, what if I decide to write the coefficient matrix as the product of elementary matrices, just to show off? <laughs> that would work. It's probably not the most efficient way of doing it. You know, there's. All those equivalent conditions, if you have any one of them true, they're all true. So we've determined this set is not linearly independent. So what does that mean? 
in that case, that means that one of those vectors, let's just say the third one, is definitely a linear combination of the first two. If none of them were linear combinations of each other, then the set would have been linearly independent. Now, this is where it starts getting kind of interesting because there's some conclusions that we're going to make and we want to be able to make them easily. All right, we new set. Call it set T. T is 1, 0, 0, 1, 3, 7. Is this set linearly independent or is it linearly dependent? Dependent. You said, well, you didn't do any work. How do you know? 3B1. Well, is it kind of obvious that this is three of these plus seven of these? That, that, that made it kind of easy, didn't it? But there's something else that's actually hidden in that. Okay? Let me change the question. I, I like that, that you said dependent and you said because. I could easily write the third one as a combination of the first two. That, that's a no-brainer. Now, I don't think it's easy to write any of these as a combination of the others. What do you think? Well, I'd set up my system of equations. OK. Let's do this. So V1, V2, V3. So C1 V1s plus C2 V2s plus C3 V3s equals, have the right number of zeros, please. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to mess the, that part up. OK. without doing any work whatsoever? It doesn't. Why? Because 5v1 plus v2, then multiply v2 by negative 1, and it's okay. 1 again. Yep, I'm, I'm, be lazier than that, though. There's more variables than equations. Ooh. I have two non-zero rows, and I have three variables. Oh, that means this is going to be parameterized no matter what. It is consistent because it's homogeneous. Does everyone notice that you have more unknowns than you have equations? But you didn't see that until I wrote the matrix. Now, could you have answered this question without doing any work? Yes. You're in R2. I gave you three vectors. They have to be dependent. Huh. That's it? Yeah, because if I set up the system and I give the matrix, I'm going to have more unknowns than I have rows. That's always going to be the case. I gave you seven vectors in R5. Do you know the answer without doing any work? Yeah, it's dependent. Because what would the matrix look like? More unknowns than equations. Oh, so if I know the dimension of, well, Rn, you know, third dimension, fourth dimension, whatever. I know that number. If I give you more vectors than that number, it has to be dependent. Okay, so go back to the one, zero, zero, one example. Every other vector I could clearly write as a combination of those. That just made it easy. But now it wasn't obvious, but I guarantee you, any of these vectors could be written as a combination of the other two. That wouldn't be a hard thing to solve. That's basically question one on your next quiz. I'm asking you to write a linear combination of the given vectors. That, that's not a hard thing, but I gotta use a matrix. You know, do a little bit of algebra. So independence, if I give you too many. So here's, I want you to think of the following. I, this is the example I've been using for years and years because I think it makes it easy. Now, let's suppose that the floor, let's say the floor was tiled. Like in the old days, we actually had those square tiles. You could look at the floor and you saw these square tiles. Let's pretend the floor had square tiles. In fact, let's say, then it takes exactly 100 tiles to cover this floor. Think of every tile as a vector. Okay. Now, I want you to think of it this way. Every tile is a vector. If I have two vectors that are multiples of each other, you're going to stack them. I have a vector here, I have a vector here, and then I have a third vector that's a linear combination of those two. Then I'm going to have it overlap those two. Like that? I have a vector that's a linear combination of three or even four. I'll have it, you know, like the four corners thing. I'll have it 
kind of overlapping several vectors. So I'm gonna put all the vector, I'm gonna put all the tiles down on the floor. But every vector that's a multiple will get stacked. Every vector that's a linear combination will overlap. So the easiest way for you to look at the floor, if every, every tile is a vector, if none of my tiles overlap, then we can say they're linearly independent. That's what it will mean to be independent, that none of them overlap. None of them are multiples, none of them are linear combinations. If it takes 100 tiles to cover this floor and I give you 10 and I randomly spread them out, pretty easy to see that they would be independent. I'm going to give you 112 tiles. It takes 100 to cover the floor. Tell me about the 112 tiles. There's going to have to be some overlapping. Do you agree? Because if it takes exactly 100 to cover the floor, the moment I gave you the 101st tile, it's got to overlap some other tiles, doesn't it? So if I give you too many tiles, it's automatically dependent without doing any work. Now, I only gave you three tiles. Obviously, they're independent. No, actually, I gave you three tiles that were all multiples of each other. That's <laughs> still like a check, wouldn't it? The only time it's automatic is if I give you too many. So if I give you three vectors in R2, think of I only need two tiles to cover my floor, and I gave you three. The third one's got to be a combination of the first two, or even a multiple of one of them. But what if I give you two vectors in R3? If I only give you two, they are either multiples or they are not. Agreed? And if they were not multiples, then they're automatically independent. Two is your favorite number of vectors, just so you know. Because they're either multiples or they're not. I don't have to do any work. But if I give you three or more, you've got to do a little bit of work. Okay? I like the determinant idea, but if the number of vectors doesn't create a square matrix, I can't use a determinant, obviously. So I still have to be able to do the row operations. All right. So They live in a vector space. What vector space is this a subset of? R4? No. They're not vectors. Okay. Uh, M22. Uh, two two. M22. Yeah. Because we're going to be working with matrices a lot. <laughs> These are an M22. I gave you three two by two matrices. Well, I'm pretty sure none of these are multiples. That's kind of obvious. But one of them could still be a linear combination of the other two, or it's not. So now this is not as trivial as the first two examples. This one's going to require a little bit more. So let's start by doing this. Let's, let's call this, uh, how about A, B, C? I like being lazy. So, or actually, uh, sorry, not A, B, C, that M1, M2, M3. I'm using C as a coefficient. A, B, C wouldn't really be a good idea, maybe. So I have C1 of matrix 1 plus C2 of matrix 2 plus C3 of matrix 3 equals what? Uh, zero. Oh, sorry, that's the zero matrix. The 2 by 2 zero matrix. Good. A lot of folks will make the mistake of putting the number zero there. A linear combination of matrices can only be another matrix, right? It can't be a scalar. Can we write um, Z22? Writing out of Z22? Yeah. Zero is 2, 2. Oh, 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 oh. You said Z. You mean yeah. like that? that? That's how you would write. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, a I, big zero. And, yeah, I might as well just write this. Now, this will lead to a system of equations, and I, I need to write that. But the easiest way to think about this is the definition of matrix addition is you add the corresponding component. So let's, it doesn't matter what order. I tend to just kind of maybe go 
you know, maybe go clockwise or something. So I have negative 1 C1 plus 2 C2 plus 2 C3 equals 0. Now I'm in the upper right position. 2 C1 minus C2 plus 2 C3 equals 0. And maybe I'll go to the lower left. Okay, C1 plus 4 C2 plus 10 C3 equals 0. Now I'm in the lower right. 3 C1 plus 3 C2 plus 12 C3 equals 0. Does everyone see that? I gave you three 2 by 2 matrices. 2 by 2 matrices do not create another matrix. That doesn't make any sense mathematically. Vectors do not create a matrix. But my system of equations can create a matrix problem. So essentially, I have the following problem. I have negative 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, negative 1, 4, 3, 2, 2, 10, 12, C1, C2, C3, C4, uh, not, I'm sorry, not C4, C3. C3, and that equals 0, 0, 0, 0. Quick check, this is 4 by 3, 3 by 1, 4 by 1. This is what I'm solving, but I cannot use a determinant. I can't use an inverse. The only thing I can do is row operations. So since I'm going to do row operations, rather than write it as a matrix product, I'm just going to augment this with zeros. Everybody cool with that? So let's do row operations. All right, so two row ones plus row two. Zero, three, six, zero. Row one plus row three. Zero, six, twelve, zero. And three row ones plus row four. So zero, nine, eighteen, zero. Hmm. How about if I do negative three row twos plus row three? Did I? Oh, yes, yeah, so, sorry, negative two. And then negative three row twos plus row four. That's it. Okay. It's not the rows of zeros. You knew, by the way, did you know you were going to get a row of zeros no matter what? Yeah, you had four rows and only three variables. You were going to get a row of zeros no matter what. And a row of zeros does not make it dependent. No, 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 no. One row of zeros would have meant unique solution. Why? I'd have the same number of variables as equations. I got two rows of zeros, which means I have two equations, three variables. Therefore what? I'm going to write it a different way. There are non-trivial solutions. In a homogeneous system, the trivial solution is always a solution. It is always consistent. You're not trying to determine that whether it's consistent or not. It's already consistent because the homogeneous can always be solved by the trivial. We found non-trivial solutions, which means there's no unique solution, which means there's infinitely many solutions, which means it's parameterized, which means it's dependent. All those are the same thing. So the fact that they're non-trivial solutions, what can you tell me about S? Or, or we say linearly dependent. Now, that one was kind of confusing because I only gave you three matrices, but I still made one of them a linear combination of the other two. Okay? Let me throw a what if at you. I need to change it. Now I'm gonna throw a what if at you. All right, let's change the 12, all right. Which favorite number I'm going to say 12? 13. 13, all right, great choice. Now it's a brand new question, isn't it? These are not the same three matrices I started with. Now, I've got to keep track of the changes here because there's so many of them, right? What does this become now? What did we do? We did three of those, so that would be now a 19. Oops, sorry, I need to do that in black. My bad. And this is now what? 
Does that change anything? The last statement says that C3 is now zero. So when I go back to here, that'll give me C2 is zero. When I put them both in here, that'll give me C1 is zero. The only solution, you say it in words, the only solution to the homogeneous system is the trivial solution. That's an important statement. The only solution is the trivial solution, therefore, independent. That's how close it can be. I changed one number and it changed everything. That's why you have to go through the whole process. We like independence. We, we would prefer. So what I gave you was an example where I only gave you three tiles, but they overlapped originally on my big floor that needed 100. I gave you three, but I still had them overlapping. The second case, they were all different from each other. Okay, so keep that in mind. If I give you too many things, elements of the vector space, now the problem is, how do I know what too many is? We don't know that yet. We will know before the end of today. Um, so we're, we're learning how to find this, but what does it actually mean? Well, the idea that we're heading towards is that if I have a set of linearly independent elements, sometimes it makes it easier to describe the vector space in terms of those linearly independent elements. That's, that's where we're going. We're going to actually define that before we leave today. That very specific set of elements. Okay? Now, next word. That's linear independence. Now, there's another word that goes with it, but it means something completely different. But the two kind of go hand in hand. The next word is spanning set. We had a linearly independent set. Now we want to talk about a spanning set. Okay? A spanning set. Let's consider a set, oh, let's use the same set we were using before. I have a set of k vectors. I did not say these were linearly independent. I don't even care if they're independent. I mean, it's nice if they are, but they don't have to be. I gave you 25 vectors in R2. They're probably not independent. Now, consider the following set. I just created an infinite set. Before we created a single equation and we were looking to solve for the coefficients, that's not what I'm doing now. Now I'm saying, consider your C's being any real number, each of them. So I've just said, I want to create a set that is every conceivable linear combination of these. It's an infinite set now, isn't it? There's infinitely many vectors. Heck, there's infinitely many choices just what to use for C1. This new set I've created is absolutely a vector space. It's pretty easy to see because, you know, if I take every conceivable linear combination, then any two vectors in it when added will still be in it because I've got every linear combination. If all my c's are zero, then I clearly have the zero vector for whatever space they live in, okay? Now, the question is, I just took every conceivable linear combination of these guys. Either that set is all of Rn or it is... Here's Rn. It's all of Rn, it's bigger than Rn, or it's smaller than Rn. If that set isn't all of Rn, what would it be? It would be smaller than Rn. It can't be bigger than Rn. So if all of these vectors live in Rn, and I took every conceivable linear combination, let's put a number. All these vectors live in R4. And I took every conceivable linear combination. I can't get R5. <laughs> right? I still only have four components to each vector. But could I get a subset of R4? Mm. Let's do something we already know. Okay, we're in R3. Here's two vectors coming out of the board. We know they will uniquely determine the plane. If I take every linear combination of these two, that will actually generate every single vector that is currently on that plane. We know this. We know this from Calc 3, we know this from this class. 
I give you two vectors, just two vectors. Two vectors do not form a plane. Two vectors determine the plane. But I have to take every linear combination of these vectors, including the zero vector. So I do a little bit more of this one, then I get more vectors in this direction, I do a little bit more of this one, I do some negatives to get the guys on the other side. I take every linear combination of these two vectors, I will get a plane in three dimensions, but do I get all of three dimensions? No, I only get a subset. But that plane in 3D is going to be a subspace, isn't it? Because it's going to satisfy the closures and it's going to include the zero vector. Okay? So either this is all of Rn or it's something smaller, but it is most definitely a vector space. This set that I've created is called the span of S. And we often just write it this way, span of S. We're lazy. S was a finite collection of vectors. There's only k of them, it is not infinite. But if I take every conceivable linear combination, I will get the span of that set. Oh, okay, so that set spans all of this. That's kind of the idea of the word span. It has spanned all this. The two vectors in R3, I will get the plane. The whole span of those two vectors would be a plane. Now, this isn't real complicated. I give you two vectors in R3, and then I give you a third one. Now, if I consider every linear combination of these three, what do you think? We'll get all of R3, won't we? Huh. I'm going to give you two vectors in R2. And they don't necessarily have to be right angles. I'll give you these two. Now, I'm going to take every conceivable linear combina combination of these two. Will we get all of R2? Yes, we will. Okay, so the span creates a vector space, but it might not be the whole vector space. It might only be a subspace. If the span of S was all of Rn, if it equaled Rn, this is set equality. Set equality means you have two sets that contain exactly the same elements. These are not scalar values. This is one of those rare times it's not an equal between numbers. So equality between sets means the sets are identical. If I put an equal sign between two vectors, if we're saying the vectors are identical, an equal sign between two matrices says the matrices are identical. Right? Usually we think of equal as being like, you know, equal six, but it means they're identical. If the span of S is all of Rn, then S spans Rn is what we're saying. S will span Rn. All right. I needed 100 tiles to cover this floor. And they over-delivered and they gave me 200. And I laid them all down and the floor got covered and I've got, it's several deep, you know. There, there are overlaps all over the place, but I covered the whole floor with tons of extras. Do those 200 tiles span my floor? Yes, they do. Are they linearly independent? No, they're not. Yeah, they have nothing to do with each other. If I only gave you 50 tiles, they could be linearly independent, but they couldn't span the floor, could they? They're not enough. So linear independence, if I give you too many, you know. There has to be overlap. When the question of span comes up, I can give you too few. I'm going to give you two vectors in R3. If I take every linear combination of them, can I get all of R3? No, there's not enough. That plane is the most I could get. So if I'm giving you vectors in R3, what's the least number I can give you? Three. three. <laughs> I've got to give you at least three. Can't get all of R3 unless I give you at least three. But what if those three are all multiples of each other? Oh, then they won't span R3. But if I give you less than three, I don't even have to ask the question, and they're not enough. So I give you a set of vectors. I take every conceivable linear combination. That's the span of that set. You're either going to get the whole vector space you live in, or you're going to get a, something smaller. So the question is, do the vector span? I can give you too many. That's OK. If I give you five vectors in R2, will they span R2? As long as they're not all multiples. If I give you five vectors in R2 and they're not all multiples, they will span R2. Yo, know, I gave you some extras that you didn't need. But that's OK. It's OK to have too many. Does that make sense? So, it's a difficult question, 
but I'm going to I'm going to do it a different way. I'm going to show you something. All right. I'm going to do a simple example here. Do you agree that S is a subset of R3? Why do you know that? There's only three elements. There's only three elements. You got to, that has to be a no-brainer, but sometimes we, we don't know what we're looking at. We, we make a bad decision because we're looking at the wrong thing. Each of these vectors has only three elements. They all live in R3. S is a subset of R3. My question is, do these three vectors span R3? Meaning, if I take every conceivable linear combination of these three, will I get R3? Will I get something smaller than R3? So let me give you some ideas. What if, what if all four of these vectors were multiples? Then what is the span? It would just be a line in R3, wouldn't it? A line is one dimension. So just for fun, if all four of these vectors were multiples, and I get basically gave you the same vector four times, the span of those four would simply be a line. Why would it be a line? Because every linear combination means every scalar multiple. Oh, okay. I would be a line. What is a line in 3D? We'd say it's a one-dimensional subspace of R3. That's the formal way of saying it. A line is one-dimensional. That's easy. What if these guys here all lived on the same plane? Would this span R3? No, we'd say it is a two-dimensional subspace of R3. What if only one of these was a combination of the other three? Would they span all of R3? Yes. yes. And then the, the answer to the question is yes, they span R3. How do I figure that out? Well, the formal way of doing this and the right way of doing this are not related. Let me show you the formal way of doing this, which you're never going to do because you're never going to be able to answer this question. The formal way of would be saying, we'd say C1, V1 plus C2, V2 plus C3, V3 plus C4, V4 must equal, and I'll just use U1, U2, U3, U, oh, I'm sorry, U1, U2, U3, where the UIs are elements of real numbers. In other words, a linear combination of these has to produce every possible vector in R3. But when I set up this as a matrix equation, Hey, again, I'm showing you the formal textbook way that you're never going to do. <laughs> because you won't be able to do it. That means that I'm going to have a matrix that looks like this. You have to solve this and show it's consistent. Are you going to get a unique solution? You have three equations, you have four unknowns. Are you going to get a unique solution? No. Oh, so there's two possibilities. You're either going to get a parameterized system or it's inconsistent. But the problem is U1, U2, U3 have to represent every real number. So when you start trying to navigate this, it's going to get really ugly really fast and you're going to reach a dead end and go, I don't know how to interpret this. So don't do it this way. Would you ever do it this way? Yes. If you have a square coefficient matrix. Because then you wouldn't do row operations, how would you do it? A You'd use a determinant. You cannot prove span this way. It won't work. You can try, but you're gonna, it's going to reach a dead end. If I gave you the same number of vectors as the space they live in, in other words, if I gave you three vectors in R3, then my coefficient matrix would be square. Oh, now I have something of the form AX equals B, and that has a unique solution if and only if the determinant of A is non-zero. And then I can make that conclusion, span or not span, based on the determinant. But I can only do that if it's a square coefficient matrix, and this is not square. In fact, it's often going to be the case that your coefficient matrix isn't square. 
So determinant keeps getting taken out of the mix. So how do I do this? I'm trying to determine if they span R3. Here's how you're gonna do it. You're gonna put your vectors down as rows. By the way, is this set of vectors linearly independent or dependent? Uh, Without doing any uh, work. Uh, dependent. Dependent because? Because there's more vectors than there are. Um, there's four of them. There's too many. Yeah, there's too many. Because if I set up a matrix equation, we'd have more unknowns than we have equations. I know these are not independent, but I'm not trying to show independent. I'm trying to show that I can get all of our three if I take linear combinations. So what I want to do is, do you, by the way, if we do row operations on this matrix, you notice it's not, it does not represent an equation. There's no equation I'm trying to solve here. If I do row operations on this matrix, will I get a row of zeros? Yes. Absolutely. Why? Because there's, there's more rows than yeah, there's more rows than there are columns. I'm going to get a row of zeros. But I could get two rows of zeros. I could get three rows of zeros. If they were all multiples of each other, I would get three rows of zeros, wouldn't I? If the last two were combinations of the first two, I'd get two rows of zeros. And if the last one was a combination of the first three, I'd get one row of zeros. Independence is not part of the answer here. I'm not looking for independence. I'm looking for how many of these are combinations of the others. That's it. This is how you prove span. And this is actually quite simple, but I find most people will do something else. And then their final answer will just end up being a guess. <laughs> yeah, this is how you show span. We already know we're going to get a row of zeros. The question is how many rows of zeros? So I think my first step is going to be row 2 plus row 1 because I don't have any 1s. So 1, negative 1, 3. OK. Now let's do negative three row ones plus row two. So zero, negative one, negative seven. No, zero, negative seven, negative two. No, I can't add. That's a negative one, isn't it? Negative three of those, that means negative one. There we go. Yeah, get that right. Uh, negative two of these. So zero, negative two of these would be two plus two is four. Negative two of these of negative six plus six is zero. Negative five of these plus this. So zero. Negative five of these plus this would be three. Negative five of these plus this would be negative seven. Did I do that right? Let me make sure I wrote everything down correctly. That's what I got. Okay, so I did a boom, boom, boom. Negative three, negative seven. Okay, good place to be. Now, I'm going to do a row switch here. Oops. So that row switch is so zero, four, zero, because I got that zero there. Zero, three, negative seven. Now I'm going to take a fourth of row two. Obviously, this is not the only path. All right, so let me do row two plus row one. Let me do row two plus row three. Let me do negative three row twos plus row four. And finally, let me do negative row three plus row four. The fact that it's not a one doesn't bother me. Yeah, I can make that a 1, and then I can make that a 0, but I'm still going to have three non-zero rows. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. Does this set span R3? Yes. Yes. yes, it does. Because I, when I did the row operations, only one of the vectors was a combination of the others. You, you could make an argument, okay, that means the three of the vectors are linearly independent. Yeah, but you don't... 
you never talk about subsets of a dependent set being independent. All subsets of a dependent set would be independent at some point. <laughs> I have a bazillion vectors, they're dependent. But if I take one of them that's independent, well, who cares? <laughs> the set isn't, you don't talk about subsets. So when the question is spam, it's really how many non-zero rows do I have left when all said and done, and did I have enough to cover the floor? So my floor needed three tiles to cover the floor. I gave you four, and three of them covered, and the fourth one was a combination of the others. So I'm good. They're not independent, but they definitely spam. OK, everybody cool with that? So independence and spam are completely unrelated things. So I need 100 tiles to cover this floor. And if I give you 75, they won't cover the floor. They might be linearly independent, but they definitely don't spam. OK, I gave you 125 tiles. They're definitely not linearly independent, but they very likely could spam. Wouldn't it be cool if they, they did both? Well, if I have 100 tiles to, if I need 100 tiles to cover the floor, is there a perfect number? <laughs> what if I gave you 100 linearly independent tiles? Then I perfectly, like a, like a puzzle, I, I perfectly placed them. None of them overlapped and they completely covered the floor. None of them overlapped so they were independent and they covered the floor so they spanned. Is it possible to have a linearly independent spanning set? Yeah, that is our ultimate goal. So when you ask where are we going with this, it's if I can put the two together, a linearly independent spanning set. Hmm. I'm going to keep it real simple. Is this set linearly independent? Because yeah, the one is in a different position. There's no way any combination would ever give me zeros. Right? In other words, there's no, there's no algebra I could do that would ever make things cancel. Do you agree? Only if I put coefficients of zeros could I get zeros back. Now, can I generate every vector in R4? Give me a random vector in R4. Let's just say x equals, I don't know, x1, x2, x3, x4 where the x, i are real numbers. Would, do you agree this is a random, a random vector in R4? I want to generate every conceivable linear combination of my original vectors. Well, wouldn't it be the case that this vector equals x1 times 1, 0, 0, 0, plus x2 times 0, 1, 0, 0, plus x3 times 0, 0, 1, 0? Probably should have gone with R3. Uh, <laughs> Is this a true statement mathematically? I just took a random variable in R4. Where the x's could be any real numbers, including zeros. Is it this linear combination? So did I just write every vector in R4 as a linear combination of these first four vectors? Yes, I did. So does that set span R4? Yes, it does. And you agreed that it's linearly independent. So we have a linearly independent spanning set. We have a cooler name for that. Any linearly independent spanning set. Now, linearly independent means I have a finite number of them. The span of that will be an entire vector space. But I said a spanning set, so I'm still looking at these four. The span of these four, we're saying, is all of our four. So that makes this a spanning set because the span of this set is infinitely big and is all of R4. A linearly independent spanning set oops, is a basis of the vector space. The most important set of elements that exists are a basis. A basis is a finite set. But it's, it's the perfect number of tiles. It's exactly enough to cover the floor without overlapping. OK? 
Covering the floor means it spanned, not overlapping, then it was linearly independent. So these four vectors would constitute a basis for R4. Okay? Would this set constitute a basis for R2? Yes. There's two vectors and they are not multiples. Hmm. Well, let's prove it easily. show that these generate that, and I want to show that the trivial solution is the only solution. Well, the easiest way to do that would be to do the following. Do I want to do that? No. I want to do this. The set of equivalent conditions has many pieces to it. This has a unique solution if and only if. This has only the trivial solution. <clears throat> if and only if. The coefficient matrix is invertible. If and only if it's really equivalent to the identity matrix. If and only if it be written as a product of elementary matrices. Probably more useful if and only if the determinant is not, not zero. I'm going to go with the determinant. Okay. The determinant is not zero, which means this has a unique solution. That means that this spans. It means this has only the trivial solution. That means this is linearly independent. But it was actually much easier. Once you realize these were independent, how many of them are there? Two, and that's all I really needed because you said that before. I only needed two vectors in R two. Now, why is that? Why is that? I needed four in R four. Hmm. Let's suppose I erase the last one. Are they still linearly independent? Yes. Will they span R four? No, because every linear combination of the first three would always produce a zero in the fourth element. Right. That wouldn't be all of R four. So we had to have enough but not too many. Okay, using this example, I only needed two. If I give you a third one, it has to be a combination of those two. <clears throat> the dimension, the, men, the, the dimension, the dimension of vector space V, it might be really generic, which we write as dim V. The dimension of vector space V, they could be vectors, they could be matrices, they could be polynomials, is equal to the number of elements in its basis. That's it. The dimension of the vector space is equal to the number of elements in its basis. This is a basis for R2. There are two elements. It's like, what a shock. R2 is dimension two. There's two different things going on with dimension. When we're talking about vectors, I can draw you a picture of vectors on the xy plane. And the xy plane obviously is two dimensional. I can show you vectors in three dimensions, and we know that R3 is three-dimensional. That's a geometric interpretation. And that goes in higher dimensions, even though we can no longer conceptualize it. But the geometric version of dimension and the actual formal version of dimension are not exactly the same thing. Only vectors have a geometry associated with them. And usually we think R2 and R3 because we can conceptualize, we can draw. 
Matrices have a dimension, but not a physical one like vectors do. Polynomials have a dimension, but not a physical one like vectors do. So, but I can draw a polynomial. You can only draw a polynomial in two dimensions, even though the polynomial space might be 10 dimensional. Oh, the dimension of a vector space is equal to the number of elements in its basis. That means that every basis of a vector space has the same number of elements, but there are an infinite number of possible bases. See, I just gave you a basis for R2. Is, is there maybe a, an easier one to work with? Does anybody have a, a really good basis? I'll call it B prime. Zero, zero, one. Would, would this serve as a really useful basis for R2? Probably more useful than the first one, because if I gave you a random vector in R2, 9, 3. Well, it's 9 of these plus 3 of these. Uh, I have to do some algebra here. <laughs> would you say that was easier to work with? If I give you four vectors in R4, wouldn't you rather be those four? Every vector space that exists has one basis that we'll call the easy peasy basis. Meaning there's no possible way you could ever miss any question involving that basis because it's all got a one and a bunch of zeros in every position. This is called the standard basis. <laughs> Every vector space has one basis called the standard basis. That's the O duh basis. The absolute gimme you can't get it wrong basis. Every other basis is a non standard basis, and there are infinitely many of them. Okay? If I gave you any four vectors in R4 that were linearly independent, they will have to be a basis. Why? Because if they're linearly independent, think of the tiles on the floor. It takes 100 tiles to cover the floor, and I gave you 100 linearly independent tiles. They have to cover the floor, don't they? Which means they now have to span. Ah. So in general, it turns out, to prove something is a basis, you have to show linear independence and span. But there's a very powerful theorem, very powerful theorem that we use that saves us a lot of algebra, okay? rather than vectors, because I could be talking about things that are not vectors. If I give you a set of elements and they are linearly independent, that does not make them a basis. If I give you a set of, of elements and they span, that does not make them a basis. Both things have to be true. But the proof of linear independence is significantly easier in general than the proof of span. So if you have a set of linearly independent elements and you have exactly the right number of them, the theorem is they have to therefore span. Think tiles on the floor. I gave you enough to cover the floor, but they didn't overlap then they would have to also span. So any set of n linearly independent elements in a space of dimension n must span, therefore you form a basis. So if I give you three vectors in R3 and you prove independence, then they have to span, therefore there's enough for a basis. If I give you three in R4 and you proved independence, they can't span, they're not enough. It's not a basis. Independence does not mean basis, but basis means they are independent. So you always start by showing independence and then look at how many there are. Does that, does that help? So the standard basis, which is always the easiest one to find, doesn't take a lot of work. So here's the question. <clears throat> I'll keep it small. I want you to consider M23. What is M23? You all agree with that statement? M23 is the set of all matrices of that form where the numbers are, can be any real number. 
I would like to determine a basis for this. And, and when you're determining a basis, always start with the standard basis. It's easier. Hmm. It's going to take you a minute. Do you agree with that? Yeah. I just wrote a random matrix in M23 as a linear combination of these six matrices. And you notice about them. Each of them has exactly one, one, and zeros everywhere else. So do you think we found the standard basis for M23? Yeah. It would be these six matrices right here. The conclusion is not that you could tell me the standard basis. The conclusion is you can tell me the dimension of M23. What's the dimension of M23? Six. Ah, maybe you didn't see that one coming. What is the dimension, therefore, of M, M, M? M times N. Most people don't realize it. They want to add them. They want to do something else. Nope. If I have the set of all three by five matrices, there are 15 positions that each could have a one and the rest zeros. So there are 15 elements in its standard basis. So M35 is 15 dimensional. Don't think geometry. Just simply think how many elements in the basis. So any set of 15 linearly independent matrices, yikes, <laughs> would form a basis. I'd rather work with the standard basis for now, okay? Have we got that? It's kind of cool. It's kind of crazy, kind of really crazy abstract. So when you leave today, there's three things I need you to know. What is independence? What is span? And then what is a basis? Because a basis is going to be the most important set we work with the rest of the way. And we're going to deal with bases. Bases, that's plural all the time. So if the standard basis is so easy to find in general, then, then why would we spend so much time on bases in general, if it only takes me two seconds now from, for the rest of my life to determine the standard basis of anything. Because the standard basis is never going to be the basis we work with. Not because we want to make life hard, no. The answer to every question that will come up will be a non-standard basis because that one is actually the one that will be easier to work with. But this non-standard basis is a mystery to us for a while. We will learn how to find Every, we, we are too far from everything now. There's still a million things that have to come up. But every matrix, every matrix, will have a set of vectors that will, will serve as a basis. Think rows, columns. We'll have a set of vectors that will serve as a basis for that matrix. But there's a very, very particular set of vectors that I want to use. And they will not be the standard basis actually ever. Hmm. It, it, I call it the magic set of vectors, and we're going to learn how to find it much later. That's chapter 7. But I'll give you a hint. The, the magic set of vectors that allow us to solve all sorts of problems that we don't know we can solve today. Problems that would be on fathom to do algebraically, if I had the right set of vectors, might be absolutely trivial, light speed kind of stuff. Like the stochastic matrix. Remember I talked about the population? What if I knew that at the start of the problem in the first step? Yes. There is a magic set of vectors. They have a name. It's the most important thing you're ever going to learn the rest of your life in mathematics, I'm, I'm guessing. They're called eigenvectors. You may have heard that term before. That is the single most important outcome you may ever do in math the rest of your life because it is the thing that is used outside of this class more than anything way, way beyond calculus. <laughs> most everything you'll do in physics has to do with that. Everything in statistics has to do with that. Yeah, it's, it's the foundation for so much but as we get there, it won't be hard. But we understand there's a, there's a beautiful mystery non-standard basis, and we'll learn how to find it. It's just a simple algebraic process. But there's a whole lot of things we need to do. We're still in chapter four. That comes in chapter seven. <laughs> so there's a whole lot of stuff. Now, one of the promises I make. Chapter one, what did we learn? 
how to solve a system using a matrix and parameterize. That was the number one thing. And then we had some really good examples at the end. Chapter two, we learned the algebra of matrices. How to add them, how to multiply them, how to find transposes, how to find, what else, inverses. Chapter three, everything about determinants. Chapter four, everything about vector spaces and now a different way we're gonna to learn to represent solutions. That's, that's really next day. Chapter five, vectors. Everything that we need to know about vectors themselves. And, and we're gonna revisit some of the Calc 3 concepts, but vectors and all their stuff. Chapter six is something called linear transformations. The most important aspect of what a matrix actually was created to do. Nothing to do with solving systems. Something way bigger than systems of equations. And then in chapter seven, we learn the eigenvalues and eigenvectors and how they work. And all of the things we did along the way will seem completely unrelated in some degree. And there will be a problem that I do. And I'll tell you what day I'm gonna do this problem. And, and this is like the, it's like the coolest day ever, really. Uh, on the 16th of November, oh, perfect, it's my wife's birthday too. Um, we're gonna do a problem. And we'll probably start on that board and end on that board. And in order to solve this problem, I am going to ask you a question. You will remember what I'm telling you right now. I'm gonna ask you a question. I'll say, what was the most important thing we did in chapter one? You'll say, it's that part of the problem. How about chapter two? That part of the problem. Chapter three, that part. We cannot solve the most important problem that we're gonna look at in this entire course without doing the most important thing from every single chapter along the way. And at that point, you will realize why we had to do everything we did in this course, even things that seemed algebraically just horrible and tedious. And boy, wasn't there another way? No, we had to do things this way. We're gonna to get to a point where you'll realize every problem we do, we are going to use an aspect of every single lecture of the entire semester in order to solve the problem. And that will be the coolest thing ever because you've never done that in a math class. You usually move on to different things and it feels like every time we move on, it's a completely different animal. No, what it is, it's a different puzzle piece. But when I put them all together and we solve the big picture, which is what chapter seven is. Chapter seven is the reason this course exists. Chapter eight is the complex version of chapter seven, so we just touch on it. We don't spend a lot of time, we spend two days. Then for those of you who take an upper division linear algebra, who would do that? Probably all of you, actually. <laughs> if you're math or engineering, you're, you're all gonna be taking, or computer science. Yeah, most everybody, if you go back and look, oh shoot, I have to take upper division. My strongest suggestion to take upper division, do you know when you should take it? Right after that. Next semester, yeah. Even if you're still here, take it through Open University of San Diego State. Every student I've ever had that went through that, if they took it early, every time they said they were the top student in the class by a lot. Because what does everyone else do? They wait two to three years. And then they take it, and they forgot all of this. The first day of that class will feel like the next day of this class. Maybe they spend a day reviewing this whole semester. No joke. One day reviewing the entire semester. And then they hit the ground running. And if you did well in this class, by the way, do you know what the prerequisite for the upper division version of this class is? This class and this class only. This is the only prerequisite that exists because this had its own prerequisites. If you're a computer scientist, I have friends who are software engineers who said the single most important class they ever took in their entire life was the upper division version of this class. It's the one they use the most often. Writing code, yeah, the logic. The ability to understand algorithms. If you're a mathematician, the two most important classes you probably take are discrete math in this class on the way up. Every class is based on that. Engineers, I think it matters which type of engineering you're going to. But most, most people, by the way, I, I went back to student school in the state. Um, in the 254 class, there were as many engineers as there were anything else in that class. At San Diego State, most of the engineers were required to take the upper division. And most of them struggled mightily, if not failed it outright. Why? because they waited two to three years when you shouldn't even wait a semester. Think about it logically though. Yeah, this is the only prereq, don't wait too long. Now the problem is you're taking this in the fall, so spring may not be convenient, but maybe next fall if you're transferring. That might make more sense. You said something about Open University, is that like a, at That's that you don't have any to person, any human being that doesn't go to the school can take any class at the school without even meeting prereqs. UCSD is the same thing. It's called University Extension. My son is taking a class there right now. Um, he's already you know, out of college and everything. You can take any class you want. You just have to have instructor permission and then you pay for the class separately. 
If you're a Mesa student and you want to take multiple classes, you go through Open University. If you only want to take one class and you're a Mesa student, you do something called cross-enrollment. Best deal on the planet Earth. Now, I don't know if the rules have changed, but pre-pandemic, cross-enrollment was any student who's a student at Mesa can take a San Diego State class for 50 bucks. That's the class for 50 bucks, not 50 bucks a unit. Now, things may have changed, because again, that was pre-pandemic. You do open university if you're going to do more than one class. Cross-enrollment if you're only going to do one class. And you have to be a Mesa student to do cross-enrollment. Anybody can do open university. I looked into cross-enrollment. You can only take lower division classes. Right now, you can only take lower division? Yeah, I talked to a counselor about it. Interesting. That's, that rules have changed then. Um, I think a lot of it was, there were students, and I used to counsel people to do this. You, you have the one or two classes you're finishing up here, but you really need to move on. So you're taking that upper division computer science or something over there while you're finishing up. People did that for a long time. There's not a lot of logic in taking a lower division class there, because you, you know, you're better off doing that here. Open university, you're just paying per unit. You don't actually have to be a university student. University extension at UCSD, that doesn't work as well for most people because it's quarters. And the schedules are not really compatible. All right, um, can you stop? Uh.